Hi everyone. Today we have Professor Ernest from the Rochester Institute of Technology uh, to present to us a talk on optical model, model selection. Um, professor Ernest is also a professor of statistics at RIT and he's very excited to present this talk to you today. All right. Um, thank you very much, Noor, and uh, thank you. Uh, I hope that uh, this presentation is going to live up to what it is that caused Noor to uh, contact me when she saw the paper. And uh, I looked up to what you guys are doing in this um, in this arena, on this platform of uh, the AI SC. It's uh, something quite remarkable. And uh, so I'm extremely, extremely pleased to be here. And I hope we're going to have a nice uh, opportunity together. I always have this, I always dedicate things. You know, each time I have something to do that I believe is of consequence, I always dedicate it to somebody. And uh, I wanted to dedicate this uh, with gratitude to my beloved daddy. And uh, so uh, hopefully he's looking up after me from heaven and uh, blessing me. And uh, that uh, his spirit is going to help me give a, a decent presentation. Thank you, daddy. And uh, give you a big hug. And uh, so my dad represents a lot for me. So uh, he taught me this. He taught me things that are very important. And one of the things that I remember a lot about my father is integrity. I think integrity is one of the most wonderful virtues to, uh, to develop in one's life. And my dad has this in his room. And in every piece of paper that he had, he said, the just man walked is in integrity. And his children are blessed after him. So I believe my dad blesses me a lot. You know, he left. 2004, but he still blesses me in ways that I cannot even imagine. And this talk is not possible without this beautiful smiling lady who uh, went out looking on the internet and, and she found this paper. And I just really want to thank Nora and uh, leading to this paper. She's been a, a wonderful person. She's personable. I think she's really shaping up to becoming a great data scientist and just a beautiful human being. And uh, thank you so much, Nora for your kindness and thank you for, you know, valuing my work and, uh, you know, contacting your organization and your group to make it possible for me to present. So I'm grateful. I'm very grateful for this opportunity and I'm grateful to God for everything. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nora. And thank you, um, AI, for making this possible. Anyway, um, one thing that I want to make clear before I present this, is that um, I just want to make sure that everyone listening to this knows who this presentation is for. This presentation does not claim to be some original research. It was an invitation that was given to me by the American Mathematical Society to provide an introduction to model selection for optimal prediction. And so this presentation is going to be purely didactic, you know, okay? So it's just instructional. So you're learning stuff. That's the reason why you're not going to see me putting citations because this is material that is known in the literature and uh, people have been presenting and teaching. I've been teaching this for so long, I can't even remember. And so, so that's the reason why this is not a research presentation. It's, uh, it's definitely an instructional presentation for those who uh, need it. It's not for seasoned practitioners. No, is it for machine learning specialists? And it's definitely not for data science experts, okay? So I'm just, you know, making sure that anyone who listens to this knows that this is going to be very basic and uh, very basic ideas. And hopefully somebody, to use Noor's word, is going to be able to refresh their knowledge from this. So hopefully that's what it is. Now, I don't really know the format that you guys use here, but I would love for this to be like a little fireside chat. You know, hopefully people will ask me questions that will give me an opportunity to clarify some of the concepts, uh, which I'm presenting, like I said, at a very, very basic level. So with that understanding and that very honest disclaimer, um, I want to start by saying that this field of statistical machine learning fascinates me. So it's fascinating me from the time I was a graduate student just doing my PhD in statistics. In fact, even back home in Cameroon when I was still young, I graduated with a degree in mathematics and did computer science. So I had this nice blend of math and computer science. And when I was looking for scholarship, I wanted to study neural networks. I was fascinated by artificial intelligence, and but I didn't realize at that time that it was going to you know, be so intermeshed with statistics that I didn't know back home in Cameroon because 
Cameron people did pure math or pure theoretical computer science. And if you did anything, people thought that it was because you were not smart enough. So, so nobody talks about statistics until I arrive in England where I discover statistics and find it to be the love of my life as far as, uh, you know, uh, academia and intellectual pursuit goals. I love statistics with every fiber of my being. I really do. And But something I want to talk about even before I get into the gist of my talk is this thing that I've come to call the multinomial of data science. The multi And this is actually the multinomial of every research. I call it the multinomial of, uh, of research effort. More, if you want acronym, if you say acronyms are very good for remembering things. I believe that in my talk, you will see that these four components are somewhat present implicitly or explicitly. Applications, even though I'm not going to show you some particular application, I'm just playing with different data set that exists in the public domain, like data set from UC Irvine, data set right from within R. But the motivation for data science is, you know, typically data. Right. You know, data is a raw material that generates phenomenology for which we want to understand the generating process. We want to understand the abstraction. What, what is it that is creating what we see when I see this data set, when I see this pattern, what is behind it? The application generates that. But then the application itself, what it does, it triggers like necessity is the mother of invention. It triggers a necessity for a methodology for arriving at what I call abstract representation. That's where we discovered these learning machines and we discover aspects of estimation theory and inference and all those things that are so beautiful and steeped into mathematics and statistics, right? That's methodology, creating algorithms inspired from the brain and things like that. So that's the second component. And the third one, which is extremely important, which many of you will resonate with, and I resonate with very well, having studied both math and computer science, is that, you know, you define those methodology and everything, but you still have to compute them. And finally, the last part of my presentation, even today, will be focusing on what I call the seven wheel, which is theory. And uh, I, I think that this, this quote, some people thought, it, I, I used to think it was attributed entirely to Vapnik, but if I realized that many people said this before him, nothing is more practical than a good theory. And we're going to see that it helps a lot in every single activity of model selection for optimal prediction or any other activity in, to, in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data science. It helps tremendously to have a good grasp of the theoretical underpinning of what it is that you study. So that's what I call this the multinomial. And you see, I put something in red underneath that says, Note that in this case, a degenerate multinomial is not a good sign. What I'm trying to say there is that if anyone listening to this, and I hope this is this talk is going to be mainly for undergraduates and people that are not. If, like I say, if you're a seasoned pro, I'm probably going to annoy you because I'm going to say things that are simple and trivial and annoying, and you'll be like, oh, my gosh, why did they put this guy here to tell me things I already know? But so just zone out if that's if you the initial foray shows you that this is too simple for you. But anyway, the point I'm making is that if anyone listening to this presentation is thinking of uh, starting a master's degree or a PhD uh, involving uh, artificial intelligence, statistical theory of statistical machine learning, it will be very difficult to be extra successful if you make any of the pi zero. Because there's one thing I call pi A, the proportion of effort you give to application. Pi M, the proportion of effort you give to methodology. Pi C, the proportion of effort you give to computation. And pi T, the proportion of effort you give to theory. I'm saying that all those pi's must be non-zero. In fact, even if it's very tiny, it's difficult for you to be a good data scientist if any of the pi's is zero. That's my point. And I meant to say this, and I give this each time I give a talk, at an introductory level, I always want people to be mindful of this, that uh, you need to know a little bit of the theory. You need to have some sense of the computational complexity of your machines. Yeah? And you need to have an intuition of how they arrive at this machine called Kenya's neighbor or support vector machine or all the other fancy names that we use. Behind those, there's an intuition. And that intuition is the origin of the methodology. All right? Very good. Now, I'm going to talk to you today. I'm going to take the paper that Nora saw and felt 
interested in having me talk about. I'm going to talk about something I call the seven wheels of statistical machine learning. The seven wheels of statistical machine learning are the way I teach this material, okay? I teach this material always having every single one of my students mindful of step one or wheel number one, wheel number two, wheel number three, up to wheel number seven. And the gist of my talk really is those wheels. So when you see 77 slides, don't panic. Some of them I'm just gonna be speeding through. But the, the, the first few ones are telling you almost the summary of that paper. At the start of everything, we said earlier in the, in the multinomial, the four-dimensional multinomial, we talked about the, the application. And the application usually comes to us by way of the data. So at the start of the paper, you see me talk about this script DN. And the script DN, it's a pretty compact definition of what data is. And in this case, I'm showing script DN in a supervised learning setup because I'm showing you both X and why, right? So just, I mean, I'm imagining myself that I'm in a supervised learning uh, uh, setup whereby, you know, the mapping F from the input space script X to the output space script Y has an explicit sampling on X and an explicit sampling on Y. Unlike on supervised learning where you only sample X and Y is implicit. I mean, there's always a Y, but Sometimes like when you do clustering, the, the labels are implicit. It's called unsupervised classification, if you want to call it clustering that way. So the first wheel of data science is, according to me, or statistical machine learning, that is, is, is um, this wheel number one, which, which I call data exploration and discovery. And many of you, and I looked you guys up, the people that run this beautiful uh, aggregate inlet, uh, you have played with data and everyone would agree with me that this is one of the most fascinating part when you're still just doing what we call exploratory data analysis. You're looking at data and you are fascinated sometimes by the type of data. We talk about the five V's of big data. I mean, the five V doesn't have to be just for big data. The five V is for all data because for all data, you want to know the variety. What kind of data type are they? Is it images, sounds, you know, videos, and traditional just numbers that are collected from uh, from surveys or numbers that are collected from machines and sensors and producing credit card information and all that stuff? It's variety, different varieties. How much of it is produced is the volume. Like we talk about N, the sample size, and P, the input space dimension. Or if we're talking about tensors, we can imagine like a pile and pile of matrices together. Or even we can even imagine that they're dynamic in nature. So, so we have the variety, we have the volume, the velocity, how fast are they coming to us? Are they coming to us in a batch way? Are they coming to us in an online sequential way or what? And the veracity is like, okay, we check if the data is good. Like the quality is one of the most important thing, right? Because they say garbage in, garbage out. So the, the first wheel is the data. And in that dimension of the data, what we're basically doing and you will see there's something that I coin in my statistical regression class. I call it DISCO, data, informal model search, structural model building, and then uh, model checking and out of sample prediction. I call that DISCO, right? So you, you look at it, you look at the data. So, and like I said, that's an entire, an entire field with data cleaning. And even when the data is completely clean though, one of the most interesting things is asking yourself, what is this distribution? This joint distribution is usually not known in practice, right? We don't know it, but we want to speculate based on the data set that we have. So that's wheel number one. And wheel number two is what we call the function space. What happens really is that you look at the data, maybe you're playing with some classification task and you generate your comparative box plots. And after generating comparative box plot, you suspect that maybe your decision boundaries are nonlinear or maybe they're linear. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. Maybe the decision boundaries are linear, maybe they're not linear or whatever. And that conversation that you're having at the step number one of data, the wheel number one, you're turning that wheel, you're rotating that wheel. And as you're rotating the wheels of data, you start asking yourself, what could be the relationship between X and Y? If it's in regression or in classification, you may be asking yourself, is it, what kind of decision boundary is it? Is it continuous? Is it broken? Is it extremely high dimensional? What is it? 
And that's what we call the function space search. This is the domain of mathematics and functional analysis where you study extremely complex function spaces all the way to Banach spaces, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And I've seen people working on GAN, generally adversarial networks, where you have to come up with all kinds of pre fancy depending on the task at hand. And you know, even for just continuous functions, you, you, you can come up with such a vast universe of possibility. And what is this? This is the idea that I observe this phenomenon and I'm trying to fit something to the data. I'm trying to fit it. This is the data. I want to dress it up with a dress, with a clothing that fits it right. Okay, not too baggy, not too tight, just right. So that is a little bit of my analogy when people say the word fitting. Yeah, fitting like you fit a dress, it fits something. Yeah, does it fit? Does it just go with it? Or is it bigger or is it smaller? We're going to talk about bias variance trade off later, the, the, the complexity of your function space and things like that. And so that's what I call the wheel number two. That data will lead you to start questioning what is the function? What is the thing that generated this stuff? And then after you do that, so after you think about it, the wheel number three then is, whoa, I realize if I don't start hypothesizing some small space, I could find myself searching an incredibly large space. And if I'm searching an incredibly large space, this task here will become untenable. And what on earth is this task? Well, I'm trying to take step number one, the data, step number two, function space, and I'm going to fit one member of that function space to the data. But I want to fit it. I want it to fit right. And what does the concept of right mean? That's what the quote, this is the first time we define the concept of learning. I want to fit it right. And not to fit it right, I'm going to define the concept of rightness. Some people may like dresses that fit them some way. Some people may like it differently. So that's where you come up with this stuff called the loss functions, way of measuring the concept of goodness of fit. How well does it fit? The discrepancy between what it is you imagine to be the function and what it is that you have. So this is the, the case. So in a sense, you have Y, which is the supervised, which is your response or target, and you have X and the function. And then we're just trying to define a mathematical and statistical way of searching the space of functions where we can find the one that fits very well. So we need a strategy. We need a, a kind of mechanism for searching the space of possible suitors. And that space of possible suitors is searched using what we call a risk functional. So this guy is a theoretical risk functional, right? It's a risk functional defined def define on the entirety of the population. And what we call the entirety of the population is just this X script X cross script Y. The entire are all possible pair that could be generated from that universe. And we're basically saying if L of Y X represents the discrepancy between this, we want to calculate the average discrepancy, the overall discrepancy, the discrepancy over the entirety of that universe. Right. So, like I said, many of you, this formula is pretty straightforward and simple. And I know this quite a lot. Many of my students ask me, "Why do you calculate E?" Why can't you calculate something else? Of course, you can calculate something else. But the intuition of E, though, of calculating the, the E, is that we're talking about here the word expectation. Hmm? You can think about it as the average, but you can also think about it. This is the expected loss. And I think it's very reasonable for somebody who says, I'm studying this. The loss itself is a random variable because these guys are coming through a distribution. And then I cannot make sense of a random variable unless I calculate some moments of it or some summarization of it. And so because this L is a random variable, that's why we're calculating an expectation uh, with respect to the joint distribution of X and Y. And then we just, you know, defining this third wheel is giving us a strategy. It's giving us a mechanism for then constructing it. And then what happens is that immediately we realize, oh, wait a minute. We don't know this guy in practice. So how on earth are we going to be able to construct this guy? Well, we're going to see later. You can have some theoretical views of it, of this guy. But the person who gave you his data, he's not very happy just to tell him, that, yeah, there's a function. It's called E of Y given X. So, well, and so how does that make my business better? Well, <laughs> the only way to make his business better is to use the intuition of wheel one, two, and three and keep rolling, keep turning those wheels and construct the machine. 
Anyway, so now that we have we have a strategy, we're going to now construct the machine for real, so, so something real. And that's where we enter for the first time one of the most fascinating aspects of machine learning, right, is the empirical risk minimization, is the empirical risk where we truly come into this function space. I, I know, I, you know, we, we come into this function space. Um, so how can we find out what is learnable or what parameters are learnable and what's not? Um, and what functions are able to map the data? Uh, what is what is what is learnable, and that's a very you you are actually you you're talking about a very interesting philosophical question, right? Because the learnability, we're going to touch that, and the wheel seven, right? Because usually when we look at this, I'm looking at this more from um, usually I used to present that the answer to that question you have early. But I realized that one thing that helped me in the process of presenting this for practitioners was to actually pretend at first that I can construct this function. The learnability is a very, very interesting issue that we're going to talk about at, afterwards, right? So the wheel number seven is touching a little bit on learnability, right? So it, th does, that, does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, we're, we're going to get to it. So Yeah, we're going to get to it. We're going to get, because the idea, yeah, that's, that's a very good question, right? Because when you look at this, like I said, when we were there, when you look at wheel number two, the wheel number two, in fact, in honesty, is you can look at wheel number two, like in a very simple case, you can look at wheel number two uh, from a purely exploratory data analysis. Like in a 2D that we're going to see in a little minute, you look at 2D and you say, hmm. I place the labels on class one and class two, and it seems to me that there's a function down there that would look like this. But what if you're in dimension 10, 50, 75, what do you know? You don't know much anything, right? So you have to find other ways of finding, can I actually even learn this function? That's what you, the question you're asking. Is it even learnable? Can I even actually extract something like that from the data? I think that some of your question is asking what's learnable? You know, which is a philosophical, which is the beautiful part of this thing that there's some philosophical underpinning of this. Yes. And uh, so wheel number two, wheel number. Three. Yeah, I was in wheel number four I'm, uh, when I got interrupted. The wheel number four is the one that has a lot of stuff in it. In fact, sometimes I feel almost like I overloaded this part because that's when you talk about the empirical risk. But that's when you start to address all kinds of things about the algorithm. You know, when you write this formula here, when you write this, this is just something very simple, right? I mean, this is it, it's very formula, but there's a lot of thing hiding behind that. How do you actually construct this F hat in? You know, there's an algorithm involved. There's so many things involved, the convergence of the algorithm. And there's a lot of aspects of statistics involved in that. Basically, what is the bias of this machine? What's the expected value of the machine that you construct? What's the expected value of this uh, empirical risk? And so many things. And this is one of the, I think this is where I spend most of the time in, in the paper, right? Just, just looking at several aspects of the complexity of the function space, the complexity of the algorithm. There's so many things in step number four because that's where you probably combine one, two, and three and brought it in there to actually construct something for the first time that you can truly show somebody, this is what I'm getting from the data. And that's where the conversation starts. Step number five, which is wheel number five, is after you construct that function F hat, that empirical realization of your ideal function as a member of script to age when you construct it a huge can of worm comes out massive questions come out there are so many members in that group yes this one is intending to pick the best one right by this this minimizer but sometimes this is not as easy there's so many things that will happen. Sometimes that guy may not be unique. And then immediately you're violating one of the things that we call the Hadamar, well-posedness, right? So you, you are trying to solve a problem. And one of the main things you want is that the problem should have a solution. And the solution should be unique. And the solution should be stable. And unfortunately, in a wide variety, in almost the majority of interesting machine learning problems from data that is not collected from design experiments, you always violate at least two and three, or two or three, usually two and three. That you don't have a unique solution, and uh, even the few solutions you have, they're not very stable. 
And so that's the reason why you start now coming here to refine. This is the this is the opening, the beginning of the so-called regularization framework and model selection, which is the punchline for this paper, right? So basically that we're looking at when we construct these functions, sometimes they can get very crazy. Like, I mean, their variance can get very large or their bias can get very large. And we have to be careful in selecting a member that will have the so-called generalizability. That is, we want to be able to generate because in the end, we are constantly fighting between these two things. This guy that we really wanted, so we really wanted the minimizer of this, but instead we're getting a minimizer of its empirical version. And we don't really know. And the, the whole beauty of statistical learning theory is that we have so many things going on, right? There's F hat, there's R hat, there's F, F star. There's so many things happening. And this is the beauty that we're gonna talk about with the remainder of our time. And some of that beauty comes from this recognition in regression, you have this thing called bias variance decomposition that the true error, this is the true error, this is a real error, this, this R not R hat, in regression on your realized function, that error can be decomposed into the irreducible error plus the square of the bias and plus the variance. And which shows you that if you construct functions that are only good here, uh, you're not going very far. If you construct functions that are not good there, uh, you're not going far. So you really want to be able to construct functions that really realize a trade-off between the two of them. And, uh, and that's where we introduce all the different uh, score functions for for model selection. So we have, uh, I mean, I'm just showing you, this is like a teaser. So we have different, we have cross validation, we have AIC, BIC, MLE, Bayesian, I mean, so, so many different things. Okay, so once we purify this, excuse the term, once we purify the members of that class and we select one that we're comfortable with, we are still faced with the so-called no free lunch theorem. We're faced with this thing called the no free lunch theorem. So even after you've done this, done great cross validation on BIC in the case that you have um, the, the ammunition for BIC and all that stuff, even after you've done that, you still have to grapple with this concept that there's so many different hypothesis spaces. And even within your hypothesis space, there's so many candidates that even after you do all this, some of the candidates will still look very similar. Like you can, you can find many guys whose BICs are very comparable. And what do you do? Which one do you pick? And that's why we're going to talk about model aggregation. But in the end, we're going to have to do something that I call the extrinsic, the empirical extrinsic comparison, which is just a fancy word for saying in the practical day to day. And you too know that everyone listening to this know this if you've worked in this field in the practical day to day of your data science, practical aspect of it, you will always have to consider different hypothesis spaces. In other words, uh, you cannot fall in love with one particular technique. I only love SVM or uh, I only do random forest. I mean, that's dumb. Nobody does that. Nobody who's in the right mind does that because basically what, what is basically happening is almost like a, a soldier. Somebody has a, an arsenal and in your arsenal, you want to have as many weapons as possible or, a, a, you know, a blacksmith, you know, somebody working on jewelry or a dentist. There's so many different tools that he uses to, to, to make sure that our teeth are nice. So he doesn't say, I only use one tool. That's it. No, sometimes, you know, depending on a problem, you might consider different hypothesis spaces and compare them extrinsically which is the introduction of our partitioning of the data into training and test error. And now, and the last wheel, the last wheel in this is definitely just the wheel where we do something called theoretical assessment. And like I said, Noah's question is very beautiful. A lot of time people talk about this very early on in, in the stuff, but I think in a practical day to day, what happens is people come to you with an algorithm. Usually what happens in the field of data science, in the field of practical, you know, day to day company, people come to you, hey, I have this nice intuition. I create this algorithm. People usually start almost always from methodology. I'm thinking I want to adapt this idea of the way the brain works or the way the temperature works in you know, order to construct a new algorithm. You know, simulated annealing was created, you know, based on what people do in chemistry, right? And it became a very powerful tool in the field of, uh, of, uh, of statistical machine learning and artificial intelligence for finding the minimum of a function that is bumpy in its uh, solution surface, right? But it came from the idea of simulated annealing, like, uh, you know, you have to have a, a random movement in the space of your solution as you try to find your minimizer or maximizer of your function. So the point I'm trying to make is that, um, in the practical day-to-day, -day, people bring an algorithm to you, they make it run, they stabilize it, they refine it, 
And maybe later on, a theoretician may come and say, how good is your algorithm? You know, and like I say, you, you could imagine doing this early on. I mean, you could, like I said, I call them the seven wheels. I mean, uh, I like the ordering in which I'm presenting them, though, to be honest with you. I'm almost attached to that ordering because I believe there's something almost natural about that ordering. But the number seven, you could bring it and offset the ordering, but the, the other one will stay stable. What is the point I'm making? The point I'm making is that when you see things like the Vabnik bounds, the VC dimension, the right of my complexity, when you see some of those things, first of all, they are extremely beautiful. Even the, when you have a loose bound, and we're going to talk about what, what the concept, many of you already know it, but when we say a bound is loose, what does that mean? And we're going to you know, tie it to confidence interval that you saw in your undergraduate. This is extremely important. I'm telling you, people who say who cares about the theory are lying. This is very important. Even when the bound is loose, it gives you some idea, some ballpark. It gives you some sense of how good your machine is even before you see the data. And that, that's something very beautiful. It's always been very beautiful in, in, in science. So. We have a question from our viewer, Amir. Yes. Uh, is there a way to set bounds on generalizability of various methods? If so, what would it depend on? Is, is there a way to set bounds on uh, generalizability in the sense of, is Amir asking the question, because a bound, right, Amir, is coming from a probabilistic thing. You are saying with a probability of one minus eta, where eta is very small, my true error is bounded by this realized error, the empirical plus this quantity. So you are deciding that ahead of time in the same way that when you go to a company, some people may be comfortable with a 99% confidence interval because they don't want any trouble. But the thing is that when you make that confidence level, if you make one minus eta too large, therefore also your bound will become looser. Now, they say this to insult Amir's intelligence, but the second part is that the bounds I will see later depend on something called the 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 capacity of the function class. And that's where your, your question comes in also, Noor, that if your function class is weird and, and the VC dimension, for instance, which is one of the ways to measure the capacity of function class becomes extremely large, there's not much you can do, then your learning is gonna be pitiful. You're gonna have a very nasty function. And that's where we enter with the concept, Amir, of the so-called base risk. There is a risk that you can never go under. That risk is a theoretical risk, and we're gonna see exactly what it is in classification and in regression. You cannot do better than the base risk. It's a theorem is known, it's been known forever. So you cannot do better than the base risk, but even within your function class, Amir, you have to be mindful of the fact that you, if you, if you choose a function class, it has a capacity, like a, the VC dimension, for instance, is one of them. And, and you can think of it as the ability to represent, right? So it's represent without getting drunk. <laughs> Sorry, I use this term quite a bit in class. So if your VC becomes too large, I will see in the formula, then, then your function, you, you cannot make much about it. So we see like uh, there's some cases where the VC dimension is infinite. So it's too bad that that hypothesis class is terrible. There's not much you can do. So I know I, I, know I gave three aspects to answer to your question. I gave the eta, you know, the the the, confidence level is an aspect of it, which I know you already know, if you make your confidence level too large, then your bound will become also very loose. And, uh, but if you can get a large confidence level with a tight bound, like they say to you in your undergraduate statistics, they say, if you can make a confidence level large, but by some manipulation on your sampling process, on the variance of the blah, 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 and you make your, the width of your confidence level small, then you win. That's a big, that's a great win. So three parts answer to your question, Amir. And, and by way of that, I also sneaked in some elements in um, in uh, Norse earlier question. So I don't know if that satisfied Amir. And to clarify, when you say yeah. base risk, you're referring to base error? Yes, I'm referring to base, I'm referring to the base error. Yeah, the base risk that we're going to talk about in a minute, yes. So that is the smallest possible error that you can make. You cannot, no machine can be less than the base risk. We call it R star. So that's why sometimes you compare machines to, you compare R hat to R star. And, um, and we're gonna see, for instance, even a simple machine, we're gonna see one of the machines that sometimes people may look down on it because it's so simple called Kenya's neighbor. It enjoys a very nice relationship with R star. 
and which is quite remarkable that if you don't if you don't face the curse of dimensionality uh, which can plague KNN if you are in a regime where the curse of dimensionality is not in, at play then the 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 true error of a KNN is bounded uh, above by only two times R star which is it's a pretty remarkable thing it means that machine is pretty good and we, it's not surprising if you see exactly how the machine is constructed because the machine is somewhat estimating the instrument that is used for calculating R star no more questions. So let's let's try to get down the road on this. So now, one thing that happens is that the wheel number one. I, I know I already talked a lot about wheel number one. I'm just going to go through this right now since I made a nice intro. Uh, well, I didn't say nice. Since I made an introduction, you decide whether it was a nice or not. Since I made an introduction or not. So one thing you do is that when you have the data, which is usually the starting point for us, right? if you work for a company, if you're a consultant, and then or if you have a fascination for a particular process and you're starting it to create a new algorithm, you start by looking at some data set and uh, wow you cannot do a justice to a machine learning presentation without showing a little bit of mnist <laughs> all right that this is a data set and there are many different ways you can look at mnist this is a 28 by 28 matrix we can lengthen it together 784 dimensional vector and uh, try to look at it and you were asking earlier how do you go from data to hypothesis space well sometimes you go at it just by experience and sometimes you go at it by by doing all kinds of things that we call exploratory data analysis by splitting the data by doing um all kinds of projection pursuits and just looking at the data in all kinds of ways and one of the ways we look at data is by just the so-called summaries and you can imagine all kinds of summaries or the intuition about the way the data was collected. Like this one is an image data, which you can imagine is a matrix of pixels and there's a geometry to it and all that stuff. You can start from there. And this is, EDA is something I find fascinating. I love EDA, exploratory data analysis. Even before you start talking about the distributional aspect, you know, what is the distribution of Y given X? So what's the distribution of each of the X's? And can I make a hypothesis that this is normally distributed without looking at like an idiot? Or if it's not normal, is it a mixture of Gaussian? Is it a mixture of what? I mean, what data is it? What is it? So you're asking those questions because depending on the answer to the question that you have for the data, you will start hypothesizing some candidate script H. Script H here stands for the hypothesis space or function space for representing the data. And because this one is very complex, one of the ways to gain insights into this, and I warn you, and I said it, and frankly, I stand by it, this is a very introductory presentation. So here, uh, you can imagine to gain insight into what it is, I imagine this very nice little data set that you've, you've seen like a zillion times, this banana shape data set, which is just a simple binary classification. Well, the decision boundary is non-trivial, it's non-linear, and uh, it's a... Uh, Totally weird, and you can imagine that the reds are negative one and the green are plus one, and you're trying to construct. So the question you're asking yourself is, uh, uh, how do I construct a nice, uh, you know, uh, representation of the function f? In this particular case, because we're in classification, the function f that I'm looking for is this decision boundary here. You know, says so it I mean, the, the function f frankly, is constructed from the decision boundary. It's a, it's a function that uses the decision boundary to catapult um, a new observation into class negative one or class positive one. And so we're going to start thinking about this in this terms, right? So we're going to think of the, this scatter plot suggested I cannot use a linear separator. It did. So this is what I was saying that, and I know this is probably very simple, very, very basically, this catapult suggested that using a linear will not work. It won't work. And, uh, but we'll see also using a tree will work phenomenally. Why? Because trees, uh, maybe using a, a perpendicular tree, the, the traditional trees, it's gonna give me, it's gonna give me solutions that are kind of like coarse and weird. But if I do my job very well, I could still do something by cutting it chuck, chuck, chuck and get something out of it. So I can imagine that like for instance, in a lot of cases when we do binary classification in a high dimensional space, one thing that I always recommend to people, I do do pairwise box plot. Which variable separates the class one from class two? Or it can be, I mean, pairwise box plot, you can do it also for multi-class. There's no question about it. Which class, which variable out of all your P variables separates the classes better? You can imagine even doing an analysis of variance on that or just a two sample T from those two in the case of binary classification. 
And so it gives you an idea maybe for things like trees as to what do you expect was most likely be at the root of the trees. So this data uh, step though, this is just the wheel number one, is something that every one of us, everyone in this presentation, probably everyone listening to this, does this a lot. You look at your data, you turn left and right, you, you try to imagine blocks of two variables and all kinds of stuff. And that's what gives you idea. But like I told you regarding the MNIST, sometimes this is not the way you do it though. Sometimes you do it from the knowledge of the sampling process. Like if you're studying images and you believe that your the things that you're studying, the thing that you are collecting sits on manifolds and uh, little subspaces of your rectangle or whatever that is, that will give you an idea of what kind of candidate are better for representing your, your, your uh, decision boundary. Here's the thing. One thing that's fascinating, in the paper I talk about Weierstrass, and I talk about Weierstrass because in the 1800s, Weierstrass was, and I credit him for this, one of the first initial foray into giving a generalized theorem for constructing approximators of functions. I have a function f or f star in this case that I'm trying to construct. And how do I recover that function? And Weierstrass in those days gave us access to polynomial as the as the universal approximator of smooth function. Weierstrass gave, in fact, in my book, that's one of the chapters <laughs> that we start with Weierstrass. But in the 80s and in the 90s, we had this flurry of theorems known as universal approximation theorem of RBF. In fact, they were responsible for the heydays of 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 uh, of uh, of, uh, of uh, neural networks, it, it basically says if you have a smooth function, and this is it, and, and Noor and Amir, this is probably answering a lot of your question. It, a lot of the things that you see out there, quite a number of the machines, directly or indirectly, are making the assumption. Unless machines that are studying, some machines are studying, you know, functions with breakpoints and uh, functions with uh, discontinuities and functions that are non-differentiable. But quite a number of times, people are making the hypothesis that the function they're studying, the decision boundary of which they're interested, it could be extremely hard dimensional, but the thing that is continuous. And this one, this is one incarnation. Uh, unfortunately, one a couple of my other theorems and function spaces didn't make it into my compilation. I don't know why I didn't know that I should have checked that. But here it's showing the universal approximation of RBF when your functions are continuous. So if your functions are continuous and you can find a kernel, and maybe that's the reason why in recent, in recent months you've seen this resurgence of kernel methods, of which I've written quite a bit myself, um, the resurgence of kernel methods as being able to compete quite favorably with deep neural networks. I was asking the presentation I gave at TMC in September, I was asking the question based on some of the papers and my own work, could it be that indeed this is just a resurrection, and uh, of course it's Easter, I can use that word, <laughs> this is resurrection, could it be just a resurrection of this universal approximation theorem that says if really the function that you're trying to use with a deep neural network that you're trying to learn is a nice smooth function, then frankly, maybe you don't need bells and whistles. You don't need a complex many, 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 many layers because we already established in the 1980s and late, uh, or late 80s and early 90s that this class of guys can represent us very well. So in other words, after we study the data and after the sampling process tells us something about what possible hypothesis space we can consider, this guy is telling us, in fact, there's one of my students doing his master's, we are noticing something that these kernel methods are formidably strong for this class of function. Don't get me wrong. I'm basically saying if your function is reasonably smooth, these guys, you can't beat it because you say you can approximate it to an arbitrary level of uh, uh, accuracy. Oh, yeah, here. Okay. So this is the bit about function spaces. Like I say in the paper, if you go back to the paper, you'll see I make an, a long elaborate blah, blah, blah uh, that I did about, you know, different levels of function space. You can start by just imagining that you have a function that is well behaved and you can become very specific about it as a polynomial. Or you can imagine the kernels. You can imagine that they're piecewise something. You can imagine all kinds. You can just get, you can get clever and creative based on your knowledge and based on your expertise. And that's how you create script H that you're going to search to find the best suitor for your data. Okay, that is wheel number two. Wheel number three 
is where after you do that, you now start to, you know, this is a big class of loss functions because if you remember very well, this guy here is based on a loss function, this script L here, and uh, we can define a boatload of them and, uh, and they have different um, they have different behavior on different situation. Sometimes they behave a certain way. So, um, you know, like for instance, the formidable machine known as a, a support vector machine is based on the red one, uh, and, and which is called a hinge loss. And uh, it, it's a machine that has impressed me in more ways than once. <laughs> I'm going to be frank with you. And uh, you know, given the given the right kernel, that machine, I, and I've and I've looked at it on. This weird data set, strange, large piece, small end data set, data set with all kinds of weirdness. And it's a pretty formidable machine, uh, but also boosting. I mean, the, 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 this, this one here that is at the heart of a gradient boosting is just as impressive. Of course, the one that started the whole thing is the zero and loss, which we cannot optimize. We just look at surrogates of it or different ways to get around it. And the logistic one is the one that's been used in the one single hidden one single hidden layer neural network is definitely logistic regression, as you guys know. So we can imagine this loss functions, and uh, those are the loss functions in classification. And this is a bunch of loss functions in regression where we can see again uh, Vabnik, the epsilon insensitive uh, L1, the epsilon insensitive L2. These are all different ways of measuring the discrepancy between the between between the y and f of x. And you will notice that very interestingly, those have an impact. Um, I did not have an opportunity here to show. I did not have an opportunity here to show the. Um, uh, the Huber, Huber, because those are the functions where we're going to see later that one of the ways to address the Hadamard problem that we're going to talk about in step number four and five is by way of the regularizer or even the loss function. Like if you define a loss function that's robust uh, to, 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 to outliers and, and robust to, to large noise, then you can curtail and still learn your function under very strenuous conditions. So that is wheel number three, right? So in the wheel number three, we are defining loss function and we're constructing the risk functional. This is the risk functional in where we discover for the first time, um, uh, nor we're discovering the base risk. And this is this is the the this guy is usually called the base learner. So we define this risk functional, which is the expected value in the whole universe of um, uh, over the whole universe, which is what we can call our population uh, over the you know script x and uh, cross script y and uh, of course if we're searching the entirety if we're not searching inside the script h if we're searching the entirety of all measurable functions uh, that's pretty hard and then we will find this guy which is called the base learner and the reason why they call it the base learner is right here the reason why it's called the base learner of course like you guys already know is because uh, if you look at this under this guy in classification under the zero one loss in classification under the zero one loss something very f fascinating happens it so happens that under the zero one loss that expected value turns out to be just uh, the probability of misclassification uh, which is very convenient for our intuition right because if it stays at the concept of an expected value it's an expected value is a nice thing but it's a summary yeah but here the misclassification rate is a very it's something that everyone understands the intuition of it is very good that you can you know you, you can have an empirical counterpart of it which is just the rate of misclassification out of the end observation that you have and so this intuition is very beautiful but even more beautiful is the fact that there's a theorem beautiful theorem probably one of my favorite theorems in statistical learning theory even in old days when we used to just call it pattern recognition um it's just beautiful that we have a theoretical meaning. We have a theoretical representation of the best. I call this the universal best. In fact, I have a plot that I always draw. This is the universal best. The error that this guy produces is the smallest possible error. And no machine can produce an error less than it. And the reason why it's the case is because it is universal best. It doesn't make an assumption on any space. It is the best over all possible pairings that could exist in that space. Unfortunately, though, in practice, you never know it. You can, this is just a theoretical device. You can only use it to theoretically explain how the machines work. 
because in practice you cannot compute it. Why? Because in practice you don't know this distribution. You don't know uh, this guy. You don't know this measure. You don't know this guy that is generating the data. So therefore, it's impossible for you to know the, the conditional if you, if you don't if you don't know this guy. So you, you cannot get this. So the best machine in the universe, indeed, the base learner or the base classifier, for that matter, in case classification, is the one that assigns the largest posterior probability. And and so and so maybe the reason why we'll see later that Kenyar's neighbor is so powerful is well well when it works when it's not plagued by its own issues, uh, when it's not plagued it can be a very formidable machine, quite remarkably. And because in some sense it's calculating an approximation, it's calculating it's it's an estimation of that posterior probability. It's a very direct rather. It's a non-parametric machine that directly estimates that posterior probability of class membership as a way to define, to decide where something goes. Okay, so that is our um, F star. So in other words, we are doing what we call the theoretical, this is what we call the theoretical risk um, minimization. So in the theoretical risk minimization, what we have, we have a standard, we have some standard E of L of Y, F of X is our standard. And we even, in some cases, like in the case of the zero one, which is the standard for classification, we even know theoretically what the best function is, even though we cannot realize it, but we know what the best function is. And then when we now go into step number four, step number four, like I was saying earlier, is the beginning of reason, right? So this is where, I, I don't go into steps for different machines. This is where you find ORLS. This is where you find empirical risk minimization. Every machine that we construct, in fact, directly or indirectly, is minimizing something like this. When you construct trees, it is minimizing the sums of the impurities, right? Uh, so the empirical risk in that case is the sums of the impurities through all the different por portions of the trees. So in other words, this is the real deal. This is what you're doing. Your hands are dirty. You're sitting out there and actually doing the task, okay? You're doing the task. And when you do SBM, you have a, 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 a risk functional like this. That, um, that Just a quick question. Uh, don't you need the loss function to be asymmetric for classification? Don't you need it to be asymmetric? Is it yeah. is it a requirement for the loss function to be asymmetric? Is that what he's asking? Yeah. Um, well, maybe in this case, you see many of them that are asymmetric, but you know, uh, 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 um, you don't need that. I don't think so, right? I, I don't think that you need them to be asymmetric, right? Because the, the key, the main function, the main function which they're all imitating is not asymmetric, right? So, the reason why they're asymmetric in this particular case is because of the way it works, right? The way that they, they for example, look, look at this one. But he's asking a theoretical question. I think, Amir, you're not asking a practical question. You're asking a question, can we come up with a theoretical result that says it is better maybe for the loss function in classification to be asymmetric? It seems that his question seems to be going in that direction. I, I, I seem to be hearing that. And maybe he's saying that because he sees that all this loss function are asymmetric. But I don't think they have to be, though. And um, it, like I'm saying, this is honestly wheel number four, as you will see in the paper again, is a wheel where I, ha I happen to spend quite a bit of time. And maybe rightly so, the reason four and five, because this is what we really do in practice. This is where the algorithm comes in. This is where you actually pull out an algorithm and actually compute and get a function. Sometimes what you call F hat, right? You guys know this very well. It's just an algorithm. Like uh, it's your KNN is your lines of code that is actually producing F hat. You're just injecting X and F hat, is, F hat of X is coming out of it, F hat of X. And then that's where the thing become really interesting, even though like one thing that you will know probably because you guys are practitioners in this field, you realize that in the many cases, sometimes this is not explicit like this. There's quite a number of machines where you are not really finding X as a way by, you know, for instance, if you think about it, the way that you construct KNN at first until you go to step number five, you are not minimizing some function. You're just calculating a bunch of distances and then you're using your intuition. You know, KNN is born from the intuition that if you tell me who you frequent, I can tell you a lot about your character. 
If you tell me who your friends are, I can tell you quite a bit about you without even knowing you. I don't need to meet you at all. You just tell me the group of friends that you hang out with. That's what Canon says. And I'll be able to tell you something. So basically, it's just using the proximity. It's using an intuition, a heuristic. But it turns out to be a fascinating machine, which has a beautiful relationship with the a base learner. The point I'm trying to make here is that this f hat you're seeing here, I'm showing f hat here in the form of a minimizer of a loss function, but sometimes people have come up with f hat by not explicitly showing it this way. Sometimes you have to almost a posteriori go and dig out and say, what is it that he's minimizing? In fact, I've seen a lot of work where somebody is just saying, yeah, this machine is pretty decent, but it seems like it was just an off-the-cuff algorithm. This guy just, he just went out and did this thing and there was not some kind of optimality that he was looking at a, a priori, but he was just, he had an intuition of separating the wood from the chaff and he's coming up with this beautiful machine. And so, so that's what I'm saying in the paper. Sometimes this machine could be explicitly derived from a minimiz minimization, but it could be implicitly. And whatever the case, and so, and that's very important to remember. And the reason why I say this is because of the M in my multinomial. The guys, if you are coming into this as somebody who's looking into, you know, might be getting into this field, this is such a beautiful field. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of creativity that goes into building learning machines. And you just have to let your imagination soar and come up with ways of, you know, making sense of the data, making, making sense of, you know, fitting some reasonable abstraction to your phenomenal pro to your phenomenological process so so that is a construction of learning machines and here a lot of things come in complexity statistical complexity computational complexity but one of the things that is central to machine learning though is this beautiful concept of bias van straight up because it's at the heart of a lot of processes of searching machine and i went to i went back to your undergraduate class where you were just estimating you know the mean uh, of, a, of a of a population and the mean was theta and your theta hat was just x bar and i rem you remember very well that you probably wrote this equation several times where this error could be decomposed into this component here that is the estimation error and this one here that is the bias and if you start squaring things up you you obtain this guy called the mean squared error you know mean squared error and you, you know from, you know, constructing confidence intervals and doing statistics that you, you don't always get the MVUE, the minimum variance on bias estimator. Ah, there's some nice examples where you can find it, but in many cases you don't have MVUE. So what you have to do is not to find the MVUE, or rather to find the theta that minimizes um, the theta. I forgot to give him M MSC here. You find the theta MSC that minimizes the mean squared error because, and as we see, in in here because of this beautiful this is the most important plot that i like to share today <laughs> the most important plot that i i had to go and create it myself because i didn't want to be in trouble of copyright so when i did it by hand something like this it, it summarizes machine learning really it summarizes everything that we're going to talk about right so all the things we talk about is summarizing here that what happens is that when you mess around when you come into this guy this 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 empirical risk this empirical risk if you use all your data to compute it, well, you can even use the guy that I call in my class, Mr. Memory. You can just memorize the data. And if you memorize the data, what you will do is just, he'll get your error to be zero. Yeah, happily zero. But it will be pitiful if you show him anything that he did not see, right? This is, this is a nice plot. And this plot is beautiful because it summarizes the statistics in statistical machine learning, the interplay between approximation and estimation. And here, we see here, uh, you know, on this side here, if this guy represents the complexity of your machine, well, on the left-hand side here, if this is your true error, your prediction error, you can predict in sample or you can predict out of sample. So this is, the, you know, the in sample prediction error can be easily fooled and it can be easily fooled. And the quantity by which it's fooled is what we refer to as the optimism of the training error. And that's the reason why we don't just trust the training error. As you guys know, being special, being, being practitioners in this field, you, you do this thing called the out of sample prediction, which is done through, you know, simple stochastic holdout. So basically those are the concepts that we need to be mindful of. And having seen that, it, and, and that's where mindful of the fact that this guy can, this, this error can easily get drunk. You don't trust this guy alone. You have to do something on him because 
the buyers very straight off could come for a wide variety of reasons. There's so many reasons why this guy can just go wrong. And now, besides the bias variance trade-off, the regularization framework and the model selection is going to be justified by a wide variety of things, right? One of them is the heart of our well poisonous that we talked about. And, you know, the solution may not be unique and for a wide variety of reasons. And um, one reason why you do regularization, but you can do regularization also because uh, you can make the complexity very large and not generalize very well. So that's why you refine, okay? So the reason why you're doing this is because you can just arbitrarily search your hypothesis space and get a very complex guy in there. And, and those two reasons are the reasons why you don't rely on the empirical risk, but instead you rely on a perturbed version of it. And the perturbation usually use some norms like on the on the parameters uh, of interest, which is this is probably just simple things. And one of the earliest ways to do that in the regression analysis was this thing known as ridge. And of course, that it turns out that instead of just minimizing this guy, which will result into the error just being flat and not doing much anything, you will uh, you will penalize him for uh, you know and this penalization is the thing that is preventing him from going far you know you you are restricting his complexity the pen, the penalization the penalization is something that says well you have to have a trade off between goodness of fit and complexity you can't just be complex because if you do that then out of sample you're not going to do very well and so so you we're creating this sense of uh of a trade-off, which comes from you know Occam's 12th century's principle of parsimony, that um, simpler model should be preferred to unnecessarily complex ones, right? So, so and then and then the can of worms is open. There's a lot of there's a, an entire literature. There's an entire literature on the regularization framework. It, you know, even dropout is can be in, in deep neural network can be rephrased as a simple uh, ridge regression in some sense. And, uh, you know, and so it's it's regularizing in such a way that you don't end up uh, overfitting. Right? We see here here is what we call overfitting. That the, the model it looks very good in the training, but frankly, when you when you start considering out of sample, which is what you do when you deploy to your customers or whatever that is, and the, the machine will just crash. So you want to be able to construct machine that generalizes very well and that are stable. So the reason why we do this this step number five is we want machine that generalizes very well and that are stable. So instead of just minimizing the empirical risk, we minimize the penalized version of the empirical risk. And I'm showing the I'm showing the linear model version is here just to make it clear that the machine is reduced just to the estimation of these parameters. Okay, I think that I will be soon be running out of time. So I need to make sure that I get some I get some um, I get some momentum here in order to move. So and this is just a cross validation formula. So that you know it's just basically the idea of a cross validation, you know, in the case that there's anyone in this talk in this con in this in this uh, talk that doesn't remember clearly, but the idea of cross validation is really natural. Uh, is basically that uh, we're going to mimic prediction by, you know, leaving out a portion of the data and leaving out a portion of the data and then predicting on them. So train F without that portion of the data. In this in this case, we're seeing the leave one out. In the paper, I show the I show the V fold. In fact, which here is the algorithm. The algorithm here is a V fold cross validation. Very powerful technique. In fact, every year there's new things that come out about cross validation. Believe it or not, that it's such an incredible Swiss Army knife for machine learning that it comes here in unsupervised learning in uh, in every single machine learning, every artificial intelligence where you build models and you have to select a variety of models or tune parameters. You you will find this guy coming in pretty handy. So it comes in handy to stabilize the machine like we see here, but he also comes in to tune in the hyperparameters. This is a very generalized version of the of the regularized framework where this omega function can be anything, right? So we see it in support vector machines and we see it in uh, Gaussian processes in a very abstract and uh, probabilistic version of it. It's just a very, this equation 19 is so general and so incredible that it almost contains everything because I think, because it summarizes the picture, right? It summarizes that main picture of the bias variance trade off because uh, we're controlling complexity. This one is goodness of fit, and uh, and this one is complexity. And then by being mindful 
of a trade-off between goodness of faith and complexity, we can build machines that are very strong. In fact, this is my last joke of the day, so I don't want to overspoil you with too many jokes. In fact, in Asia, in Buddhism, they talk about the middle way. I think this has something to do with the, the middle way, right? So, so, and even in our lives, you know, when when you work with something, if something is too much, you say, no, that's too cheesy. If something's too little, say, man, it's lacking. So there's always a just middle there. It seems like even machine learning is agreeing with our intuition that when it comes to learning, many processes that we see, because data is live, right? So many things that we try to model from data, they may be conforming to the way our lives unfold, that maybe, you know, going too much to the right is not good, going too much to the left is not good, somewhere central is where you find your equilibrium, your peace, or whatever that is, okay? And this is a little bit of just a pseudo code, you know, to refresh your memory, that, you know, if you're doing v-fold, I mean, I showed you the one, leave one out, which is the oldest form of cross validation, but if you're doing v-fold, basically, you leave out, um, you know, a chunk of the data, and then uh, you train without that, and then you predict for the guys that were left out, and you calculate the error. And it seems that that error is always, that error, in most cases, that you sometimes have degenerate versions of the cross-validation curve. In Wheel 4, I was basically explaining the thing about uh, computational complexity, that in, in a lot of times, people forget that it's very good to talk about this statistical stuff, but I mean, I, I know for maybe a computer scientist, this is almost natural, but I have to, with massive, well, my statistics students and my statistics colleague, I have to always bring back the computational complexity all the time, right? Because usually sometimes they line up, sometimes they don't, right? So bring out, you know, what is the computational complexity of these different algorithms? And because of what you know, Nora, that you worked in practice, the scalability is always a very interesting aspect of this because machines and technology is always kind of lagging behind science. So you always have to define algorithms that that are conformed, that are lined up with the technology. That's why scalability is an issue, right? You have to be able to design algorithms that work on very large data set with the resources that we have. So those are the things that I wanted to mention about step number four. I mean, this is, and, and a little bit, I wanted to also mention a little bit about consistency because we're going to see it in step seven and wheel seven but mention that a little bit but i think let's stop here I, i've enjoyed this and thank you again Noah, for inviting me and then uh i want to thank the whole team at um, at the ai and aggregate intellect uh this is it's always it's always fun for me sharing this this body of work and uh since you say it's been interesting i i feel i feel really i feel uh, gratified by that knowledge that it's been of use to somebody it's been such a pleasure having you professor